So why parables? Why parables? I know we've been talking about this. Pastor Daniel has been talking about it, but it's a great question because the thing about the parables are when the crowds would gather together to hear the teaching of Jesus, when I say crowds, I mean, I mean everybody, when everybody showed up. So when the Pharisees showed up, when the teachers of the law showed up, when the tax collectors showed up, when the fishermen showed up, when the disciples even, when they all showed up, Jesus taught in this particular style of teaching, this particular style of storytelling. So much so, it's so different than how the rest of the Bible is laid out that we know them as the parables. And Jesus did this for a very particular reason. The word parable actually means to compare two concepts side by side. So you compare something that is known, he tells a story of something that is easy to understand, and he sets it next to a concept that is not easy to understand, to draw a parallel between the two of them. Some would describe these as kind of riddles. In the moment, sometimes they feel a little confusing, right? Anybody ever read a parable before and thought, what is he saying? Like there's leaven and then there's yeast. What are we talking about, right? But this was intentional. That was kind of the point. I want us to jump in here to a conversation that Jesus was having, having with his disciples in the book of Matthew. Jesus had just spoken in a parable style to a huge group of people. And then his disciples pull him aside and they, they have some questions for him. So that's where we're going to hop in. Matthew 13, verses 10 and 11. And it says, then the disciples came up and they asked him, why are you speaking to them in these parables, Lord? Why are you doing this? They're, they're saying, why are you talking differently to them than what we're used to hearing you talking? Why do you seem confusing in the moment? And he answered, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. Now, some would read this scripture and still find it confusing, but I want to explain this to you. The amazing thing about these parables is that when Jesus would teach to the multitudes, that's why they called it the multitudes, because it was anybody and everybody. When he would teach to this large group of people, he would speak in parables. And those people, when he was done speaking, when they'd heard what they wanted to hear, they left and they went about their way. They went back to their lives. But then there was this smaller group of disciples that took a step closer. And to that step closer group of people, he would explain it. So this is what we know about the, the parables. Truth was spoken to everybody. The same truth. Truth is truth all day long, right? How many of you have heard me say that? I say it a lot. Truth is the same truth all day. It was spoken to everybody, but revelation was only received by those who believed in and followed after Jesus. It was only revealed to those that said, I'm going to take a step closer. And this is why the parables are so important to us, because they help us to see the truth is available to all of us. Truth is for all of us. The word of God is available. The spoken word of God is available. The written word of God, truth is available to all of us. But, but real revelation only comes when you take that step closer that is the only time that revelation comes. Otherwise, sometimes the word of God falls on deaf ears. Have you, ever, have you ever known anybody that just consistently somewhat beats people with the word? Sometimes you hear people say, well, I told them that this is what the Bible said, and they were essentially rolling their eyes, right? Because in that moment, revelation had not fallen. Truth was spoken, but there was not revelation because they had yet to take a step closer. A few years ago, the family, so the kiddos were little, we were in a grocery store. I don't know which grocery store it is, but I know we were in the taco aisle, okay? We're in the taco aisle, and um, Pastor Daniel and I are over here on the side nearest the hard shell tacos, and the kiddos, I think we had three of them at the time, were over here on this other side. So as we're walking by all of these boxes, I'm pretty sure, 
It was an Ortega box of hard shell tacos. I, it doesn't matter at all, but I'm pretty sure that it was. And we're walking past it, and literally right at the same time, both PD and I kind of stop and look at this, this box. Like we both take a double take on this one particular box. Because y'all, we were both like, did somebody put me on a box of tacos and I didn't know about it? That woman has like my hair color and from where I'm standing, she looks just like me. And the both of us like do a double take and we took a step closer and looked in and we realized it's not me, it was Reba McIntyre. <laughs> So if you've ever heard PD reference me as Reba, that was the moment. That was the marking moment. Now, I will admit that's not the first time and probably won't be the last time that I get confused for Reba McIntyre. I don't know why, but I do somehow. However, it wasn't until we took that step closer that we had the revelation that that's not me at all. Now, my sweet children, they never got the revelation because their dad, of course, was like, hey, guys, who's on the box there? And they were like, mommy. And I'm like, no, it's not mommy. But in order to receive revelation, we have to take a step, what? Closer. Closer. In order to receive that revelation. Because for those that followed Christ, the parables were meant to explain a valuable moral lesson, which they do for us still. And they were intended to reveal God's motive. Jesus' motive. His motive was to draw us closer. His motive was encourage us to step out of the group and step closer to his presence. There is a big, big difference there. There was a large multitude. They went about their way and the disciples said, I want to know more. And they took a step closer. And that is who we are called to be as men and women of God. So today we are looking for that deeper revelation in two parables, okay? Pastor Daniel, he's been doing an amazing job at just one parable, but I prefer a one-two combo. Anybody else? Like, I, I prefer like a full knockout, right? I'm going to go all the way through one, and I'm going to touch on a second one, but today we're going to be talking about the parable of the barren fig tree and the parable of the weeds. Now, in Pastor Daniel's defense, he does talk about the parable of the weeds, so technically he likes, he likes to do two as well, but We're going to be talking about both of those. So today I'm calling the parables of the figs and weeds. And we are going to start with the parable of the barren fig tree in the book of Luke chapter 13, verses six through nine. It says, then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree. First thing I want you to take note of is that fig tree. It was growing in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit. That's the second thing on it, but he did not find any So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down, he said. That's the third thing. He said, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? And the vineyard worker, he said, sir, please leave it alone for just one more year, a little more time. That's the fourth thing. And I will dig around it and I will fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine, great. If not, then we can cut it down. So this is what Jesus told. This is a story. This makes perfect sense, right? If you got a tree that hasn't grown in three years, that tree is dead, dead, right? There is no life in that tree. Pull that tree up and put a good new one in its place and grow some fruit, right? This makes perfect sense to our humanity. But there was a parallel that Jesus was drawing spiritually that was the part you had to take a step closer to understand. So the first part was that fig tree, right? The parallel is that fig tree represents you and me. That fig tree represents something that has been planted, something that has been given an opportunity to yield fruit, something that has the potential inside of it to grow and develop and do something powerful. That represents you and I. The second thing was the fruit, and that fruit is simply the understanding that there should be some kind of fruit in our lives if we are truly followers of Christ, right? How many of you remember our evidence series? There must be some kind of evidence. There should be evidence. In this story, Jesus was saying, you are 
the tree. And there should be some kind of fruit in your life. If we have encountered the power in the presence of God, there should be power in our lives. Whoever you spend the most time with, you end up acting like them, sounding like them, kind of being confused for them sometimes, right? You just end up doing things similarly. Pastor Daniel and I, we have been together for so many years, and we have been teaching and preaching together for so long. We do a lot of things very similarly. I don't tell the dad jokes like he does, but we do some things similarly. You know how people say that after a certain amount of time, you actually start looking like your spouse, right? That's not our story. (laughs) We, We have not grown to look more alike. And I think that's a great thing. (laughs) Neither of us need to come anywhere in the middle. We're good as we are. However, however, there must be some evidence, right? There has to be some kind of fruit. The third thing that Jesus said in the story was cut it down. We get it, right? That's a waste of space. And what he was saying in the parallel is that it is wasted purpose if there's no fruit. Because when we encounter the presence of Jesus, there should be real change in our lives, right? And there is a choice for us that follows afterwards. There is a choice in the way in which we live our lives after Jesus has changed our life. But he was saying, if there's no fruit, what's the purpose on it? And the fourth part, when he said, give it one more year, he was representing more time here. He was representing the grace of God He was showing the patience of God. He was showing the long-suffering love of God. He was showing the love of God that never gives up. He was demonstrating that in the natural, yeah, it seems like it's been too long. It seems like it's dead, dead. It seems like there is no fruit that is possible, but our God is the God of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, (laughs) tenth chances because he never gives up on us. We give up on ourselves. We give up on other people so fast, so fast, by the way, so fast. I could have gone to the parable about the two debtors, you know, the one that says, um, I was owed and you gave me grace, but then when somebody else owed me, I didn't give them any grace, but I decided not to. I decided to go with the fruit today, okay? (laughs) However, we are the ones that say that's too far. Our God has never done that. And Jesus wants us to know in this parable that we should be bearing good fruit, right? There is a difference between good fruit and bad fruit. Y'all, we're going to bear some kind of fruit in life. There's going to be something that follows along behind you. And either it is a demonstration of the power of the almighty God, or unfortunately, what's trailing along behind you is going to be stinking in reflection of the choices that you've made. We don't want that, right? Jesus says that we should be bearing good fruit, but his father has great grace for us and continues to set us up to receive his reward. I remember one Easter, this was probably five or so years ago because Fox was just a baby baby and Daphne was really our smallest. So she was a, she was a toddler at this point. And The two biggest gifts that we all receive, I'll just say this to get it out of the way, but the two biggest gifts we have ever received in life are the day that we, um, that, that God sent Jesus to this earth, the day that Jesus was born and the day that he rose from the dead. Amen. So on those two days, we teach our kids about the two great gifts that we were given. That is the point of those days. But because we were given such great gifts, after we focus on that, we always give our kids great gifts. On Christmas, we give them great gifts. And on Easter, we give them candy because I'm not the kind of mom that gives them candy all year long. I'm so sorry. However, you can say boo or yay, whichever. Just feel it, whichever it is. It's okay. It's okay. So on Easter, we always do a little simple little Easter egg hunt in our backyard for our kiddos. And this particular year, our bigger kids were just a little bit bigger. And then Daphne was just, Fox was just laying on a blanket and Daphne was toddling all along. So we put her eggs out in plain sight, okay? Just right there where she would have to stumble upon them. And Brecken and Finley were over just looking everywhere for them. So Daphne she walked up to the eggs that were directly in front of her and got distracted by Fox and, or by Daphne and, nope, what are my kids' names? By Finley and Brecken. <laughs> it's okay. 
by Finley and Brecken, and she went the other way. She walked right around the eggs. So Pastor Daniel and I ran along, we scooped up the eggs when she wasn't paying attention, and we ran right in front of her and put them right in front of where she was getting ready to walk, because we wanted her to find them, right? And she would toddle along, and I kid you not, she would look around and look at Bubby and Sissy, and did you see what I did there? I wasn't gonna miss their names a second time. <laughs> Bubby and Sissy. She would look around and she missed them again. And so we would go and pick them up. We did this probably five, six times, y'all. I mean, over and over again, that cute little thing just kept toddling in another direction. And we just kept going and picking them up and moving them in front of her until finally we were like, Daphne, Daphne, they're right there. They're right there. Look, they're eggs. They're wonderful. You want these? Until finally she saw them and took them. But I think so much of the time, this is what God is doing for us. We are toddling in all direction, looking for the things that we find intriguing. And he's like, I've got good things for you right here in your path. Just stop and notice my presence. And if you don't, I'll move them so you can see them again. But this is the goodness and the grace of God. So let me ask you this today. My question for you today is, how is your fruit? And I mean that. I want you to really, really think about that question today. I want you to write it in your notes. How is your fruit? Does your fruit, does your life, does it bear good fruit? Is your fruit good? Is it bad fruit? Is it a reflection of the choices that you continually find yourself making? Or are you kind of maybe dried up? Were you like that fig tree? Maybe at some point you produced some fruit and then the fruit all got taken and now you are out of fruit. You are dried up. Maybe you're feeling a bit depleted spiritually. Maybe you're just worn out. Maybe there was a great fire within you to pursue the things of God. Maybe in a worship moment, you couldn't help but shout about the goodness of God. And now you find yourself just kind of exhausted, a little numb. If that is the place in which you are, you're probably not bearing a whole lot of fruit. Maybe you're even a little uncertain of what else to do just to grow closer to God. I want to encourage you today that we all go through growth spurts and lulls, even in our spiritual walks. My uh, second daughter, Finley, I thought about it, my second daughter, Finley, she's the, the only one that I feel like has really had a difficult time with this. However, she's the only, the second one that has gone through growth spurts. But I remember a few years back, she would struggle desperately and she was always asking me, like, mom, when am I going to grow? Like, when am I going to get taller? Like, everybody else seems to be getting taller. I just want to grow. Like, am I ever going to grow or am I always going to stay this height, mom? And in her mind, we were all so tall. And I, I kept wanting to remind her, like, honey, I'm very average. Like, your mom, you don't have a great, like, height you got to go to get to me. But you're going to get there eventually. You will. And soon enough... Now she is rummaging my closet on Sunday mornings and wearing my clothes and almost looking me in the eye. And sure enough, she'll pass me, I'm sure, sooner than later because it won't be super hard to do. And then she's going to hit a lull again where she's going to slow down and she's probably going to taper off. But how many of you know that we do the same thing in our spiritual walk with the Lord we find ourselves on these great growth spurts of closeness and nearness to God where I say, you just got to take a step and you're like, I'm ready. I'm jumping in. And then other times you're like, mm, I'm going to watch somebody else take that step and then maybe I'll follow them. Maybe, maybe not. And sometimes we do these growth spurts and lulls. Sometimes we do it because we just don't know better. And other times it's because we just need to make better investments in our growth. That's what we're going to talk about here for a little bit, is how to make better investments in your spiritual growth. Because when I look at this parable of the barren fig tree, when I look at this parable where Jesus is telling this story, the story aspect of it, I see three opportunities for us to produce more fruit or to keep from drying up. How many of you want to produce more fruit in your lives, more good fruit? Amen. All right, so number one, number one. Now, you all know I like to keep at least one of my points a little spicy, right? 
right? I can't preach without giving a little bit of direction, redirection, correction all in the midst of it, okay? So know that I love you, okay? Say, I know you love me. Thank you. Okay, good. Number one, are you ready? Stop expecting others to be responsible for your development. Okay? Stop expecting others to be responsible for your development. I can't help but look at the man that owned that vineyard. He had left someone else to take care of that tree for three years, and he had the audacity to yell at that man that that tree was dying. Where were you? Why didn't you show up for your tree, right? Sometimes it, it just does us a little bit of good to be able to say, you know what? I own that. I own that. Hey, let's just say it. say it. Say it with me right now. Say, I own that. I own that. There is... Nothing that can go wrong if you just say, you know what? Actually, I own that. Oh, I only did it because they told me to. No, you didn't. Oh, well, I was only there because she really, really encouraged me and told me that I needed to be there. No, you didn't. You did it because you wanted to. The majority of the time, I say the majority of the time, there are moments. The majority of the time, what we do in the moment what we feel in the moment was what we wanted to do. Now, you may look back on that decision and say, oh, I can see now that wasn't a good idea, right? Somebody else may be able to tell you, oh, you should have listened. But in the moment, we do what we want to do, right? Now, it's not the same when it comes to our spiritual development. Because if I were to sit each and every one of you down, the majority of you would say, yeah, I want to do better. I want to be closer to the heart of God. I want to I live out the purpose that he's placed in my life. I want to live with power. I want to live unshakable. I want to be immovable. I want to not care what the enemy throws at me. Yes, I want to produce good fruit. But how many of you know that that drawer of excuses is really, really long when it comes to our spiritual development? Y'all got awful quiet. I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but spiritual laziness and spiritual apathy are real, family. They are real. We have so many Christians walking around saying, feed me, feed me. You feed me. Will you feed me? Can you feed me? Have, have you fed me lately? Will you feed me? So many of my kiddos' toys ask to be fed, and I want to just say, have you fed yourself at all lately? I can't ask that to toys, but I can ask it to you adults. Because we can shout, feed me from the rooftops. But have you fed yourself anything as of late? Now, don't you get me wrong. I asked you first to tell me that you know I love you. It is our absolute joy and honor. We live, we talk all week long about you all. Each and every one of you that we know by name, which are a great amount of you. We talk all week long about it is our absolute joy to lead you, to serve you, to teach you, to encourage you, a thousand percent, all day long. That is our joy. We wake up for it. But I will say that you have to prioritize showing up. You have to prioritize that. You have to consistently be open to what God is revealing in your life. You have to do that. You can take it, what's the phrase? You can take a cow to water, a horse to water. Darn it, I messed it up. <laughs> you can't make them drink it, right? You can't take an animal to the water. They've got to drink it themselves, right? You have to prioritize showing up. You have to prioritize being open to what God is revealing because what God imparts on Sunday, family, he will multiply on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday and on Friday and on Saturday. But you can't just put it over in a corner and ignore it. I love what Hebrews 6 verses 11 and 12 says. It says, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what your hope so that what you hope for may be fully realized we do not want you to become lazy but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised family i don't know about you but i don't just eat one meal a week i don't know if anybody thought i did but guys i don't okay i eat a lot more meals than that i got to feed myself 
As your pastor, I have to feed myself. Anybody in here only eating one meal a week? I want to talk to you. Anybody? Anybody? No! Because you may get a really, really, really great meal. We work really, really hard so that God will impart power into your life. But you have to feed yourself all throughout the rest of the week. You have to be able to own your own spiritual development. Number two, you have to be resourceful. Be resourceful. So I was on social media. I was on Instagram the other day. And I was watching the story. I, I, I don't jump on there all that often. I usually just hop on to laugh. I usually just hop on for the really silly reels that Pastor Daniel and I pass back and forth to one another. Um, however, this particular day, I watched a video of an old friend of Pastor Daniel's and mine. And he was, he was doing something that I had never seen anyone do before. And it was, it was mind-blowing for me. So... This is, I guess, a form of catfish um, hunting, I guess. I'm going to explain it terribly, but how many of you have ever heard of noodling? Oh, oh my. Okay. So I watched my friend, and maybe this was that much more traumatic because it was a good friend of mine that I saw doing this. So I guess with noodling, it's a different type of fishing where you're fishing for like a monster catfish, like s small, like boar underwater. Okay, and you're not fishing with a fishing pole. You're fishing with a glove on your hand and you go underneath the murky water where these big, big catfish live in holes way down deep. And you go under the water of which you cannot see and you dig around your little hand mitt until that big, big catfish that you can't see bites your hand. And then you pull it, you fight it. You fight that big beast all the way up to... Oh, the top of water. I'm out of breath because it was, I mean it. When I say it was traumatizing, it was traumatizing. And the reason I think for that is because my other friends had to go under to retrieve my friend who was underwater wrestling with this catfish. It was crazy, okay? I don't, I'm not going to recommend it because it was, it was, it was terrifying. I'm not afraid of things, but that was terrifying. However, I stepped back and I said, all right, it's pretty resourceful. I'm a little impressed. I'm a lot terrified, but you really wanted that fish. So you just went in there and you got it, right? We have to be more resourceful as Christians. I love, I love what the vineyard worker said. He said, give me a year. I'll dig around it and then I will fertilize it. I'll dig around and I will fertilize. Do you know what fertilizers do? I know you do. It's a redundant question. But they help a plant to retain the nutrition that it's received. And, and they supplement anything that's possibly lacking in the soil. Family, guess what? We provide free fertilizer for your lives here at Hope City in our HC groups, in our freedom groups, in our freedom encounter at the end of freedom, in our midweek chapel. How many of you love our midweek chapel? In our Bible studies, this is all intended to water the nutrients you've already received in your spiritual life. And just like the man at the vineyard dug out around that tree that he really, really wanted to live, family, your group, your group could be embedded around you to keep you strong in your life. That could be the power of the group that maybe you are not yet a part of. I love what Ecclesiastes 4.9 says. It says, two are better than how many? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. I really, really wanted an apple tree. Pastor Daniel told you that I planted an apple tree recently. I grew up with an apple tree in our driveway of all places as a kid, and it just seemed easy. Like It seemed like that driveway is like right there, and that apple tree is right there, and that apple tree is always producing fruit. So I wanted an apple tree. I thought it was obvious. You just put an apple tree in the ground and you're gonna get apples, right? <laughs> so it wasn't until after I put the apple tree in the ground, Dan over here is laughing at me as the master gardener. It wasn't until I put the apple tree in the ground that I learned that not all um, apple trees are self-pollinating. So 
What that means is that not all apple trees are actually able to grow good fruit on their own without having another self-pollinating, a better pollinating apple tree right there next to it. So there's this other type of apple tree that had to be planted in the ground right next to my other apple tree in order for my apple tree even to bear any fruit. Family, sometimes you just need to be close to other strong believers in order for fruit to grow in your life too. Are you doing the right things or are you just doing something that somebody else did hoping to produce the same result? There is a harvest just for your life that is specific to you, but you've got to listen to what God is providing for you. I promise you, you will not always feel like showing up for a group. You may not even feel like taking the steps to get to know people, but your heart longs for community, doesn't it? Your heart longs to be connected in relationship. You won't always feel like it, but you will need the strength down the road that you are investing into right now. So use your resources. Amen? Amen. And when you know, when you know the value of the fruit in your life, you will, number three, protect your fruit. Protect your fruit. Why? Because your fruit could literally change someone's life. The fruit in your life that you are intended to be developing could literally change someone's life. It's a big deal. I want to read you that second parable. We're going to just touch on the parable of the weeds in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 28. It says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody else was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. Family, I want to remind you today that you must protect the good fruit in your life because there is always an assignment of the enemy to choke out what God is doing in your life. You work too hard for good fruit to just treat it frivolously. You work too hard to be disciplined in your knowledge of God and drawing near to him to allow weeds to be planted in your life. You work too hard to just say, it's okay, I can make these choices, I can be around these people, I can be in this relationship and it won't harm me. But is it going to choke out the good fruit that God has placed for you to bear? And family, we have to stop sleeping on the purposes and the plans of God. We have fallen asleep in so many ways as a body And so often we are dozed off when the enemy is coming to take what God has been doing in our lives. We have to stop slumbering. I'm not saying you can't take a nap here and there. You can, however, we have to stop being distracted. We have to stop being numb to what is happening in life. And we have to stop allowing weeds to find their way in our lives. We have to stay on mission. Because family, your mission is your fruit. For those of you that are wondering what your mission is, what is my purpose in life? It is the fruit that God identified for you to bear, but the only way that you know what that fruit is is when you take a step, what? Closer. You have to take a step closer to the Lord, which means you're gonna step away from some other things, but you will step closer to the power and the favor of God. What is your life producing? Matthew 13, verses 13 and 16, it says, this is why I speak to them in parables. This is Jesus. He says, though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Family, we have truth as a follower of Christ. 
truth is the same. We have truth. We have access to truth. You have access to revelation, the revelation of God. God is speaking and imparting into your life all day long. Are you listening? Do you hear it? Or is life just too loud sometimes? And because we have that access to revelation, you can bear great fruit. If you wondered, if you doubted, I don't know if I've gone too far at this point. I don't know if God could do anything great through me. Our God still desires to do powerful and mighty, miraculous works through you. But sometimes you're gonna need to fertilize what's been planted. Sometimes you're going to need to dig out around your life and say, nope, I need to separate myself and allow the fertilizer of God to take action in my life. And then you have to be vigilant to guard it. Family, I will tell you that the two greatest uh, fruit seeds in my life are my, my marriage and my kids. And there is not anything that I will not do to fight for that fruit There is not anything that I will not do to make sure I protect that fruit in my life. What is the fruit in your life? And are you fighting for it? I've invited our Hope City worship team back here to lead us, but would you stand to your feet with me for a moment? We're gonna enter back into worship for a moment, but I would like all of you just for one moment, just to close your eyes and open your hands And you can say this prayer out loud with me. You can say it in your heart, but say, Lord God, open my eyes, open my ears that I may see and understand. Jesus, that you have great purposes in our life. We thank you, Lord God, that you have placed good fruit ready to grow inside of us, Lord. And I pray right now that we would be a people that would rise up. I pray that we would be a people that would say, God, I am taking a step closer to your will for me. I am taking a step closer to your heart for me. I am taking a step in the direction that you are calling me because I know you're gonna meet me there. And I pray right now, God, for anyone that is feeling dry right now. I pray for anyone that is feeling dead, dead on the inside. 
I pray for anyone that is feeling as if there's no possibility for me to bear fruit in my life. I feel that you are calling right now to those people to say, I will never give up on you. There is great fruit that you have yet to walk in. It doesn't matter the seeds that you have sown before. It doesn't matter where you have been before. There's great encouragement in this house. God, I pray that all of the followers of Christ in this room would feel so encouraged that you are digging out around their lives and you are fertilizing so that they can bear much great fruit. And for anyone in this place, anyone that hears my voice today that would say, I have never asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I have never surrendered my life. I have only sown bad seed because I have only lived for myself. The word said in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. You will find the purposes, the freedom, the forgiveness, the redemption that God set apart from you from the day that he created you in your mother's womb. And maybe you're the second person in here and you would say, I have lived my life for the Lord. I surrendered my life to God, but I did find myself in that dead, dead tree place. And I turned the other direction And I did not follow after the Lord anymore. I gave in to the dryness. I gave in to the bigger group. And I no longer chose to be the one that was stepping closer to the heart of God. Today is the day of salvation for you too. So if you are the first person and you would say, I wanna give my life to the Lord for the first time, or if you are the second person and you would say, today I want to recommit my life to the Lord Jesus. Right now at the count of three, I would love all of you, either one or two, day of salvation or day of rededication to lift your hands, one, two, three, right now. Lift your hand if that's you. If today is a day of salvation, I see you over there. If today is a day of rededication, I see you over there. I see you over there. I see you over there. Family, can we celebrate? I see you back there. I see you over there. I see you. Praise the Lord. Can we all say this prayer of salvation? Say, Father God, today is my day. Today, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I ask you for forgiveness. I repent for the way I have lived. I believe that you are the Son of God and I receive you as my Lord. Today, God, I receive your freedom and your redemption. I will be a follower of Christ starting today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Church family, can we celebrate?